Hey everybody, it's Party Elite bringing you an early look at the Queen and the Crone DLC for Total War Warhammer 2. The wonderful folks at Creative Assembly have given me an early access key and as such, I wanted to dive in and take a look at the new Lords, starting positions, units, and more tied to the DLC and the Aleth Anar free DLC as well. I'm keeping this separate from Norska and the Resurgent update just to keep things easier to digest, and I will split my deep dive into two videos to keep things manageable. There are a lot of new additions. If you're interested in seeing the Crone in action on the campaign map, I have a Let's Play linked in the description down below as well. Timestamps and links can also be found in the description below. And one final note, when looking at unit stats, you'll be seeing large unit settings based on requests I've seen from you, especially in the multiplayer community. Without further ado, let's get started. First things first, we're going to take a look at Alariel the Radiant and her High Elves of Avalorn. In the Vortex campaign, she begins at Avalorn, a province in the inner ring of Ulthuan, and even then she does not control it outside of Gain Vale, the provincial capital. The Dark Elf faction Scourge of Cain holds Tor Saroyer and Evershale, and they've also captured the Phoenix Gate and the Northwest Quadrant of the Continent. Her starting additional units include a unit of Treekin and a unit of Sisters of Avalorn, and her faction effects give her bonuses when all of Ulthuan is under High Elf control, increases hero capacity of Handmaidens by 2, reduces the cost of the Invocation of Isha, and as a corollary to the first point, she gets penalties when parts of Ulthuan belong to other races. As a Lord, she leaves buffs behind when passing through provinces, and gives a 15% missile damage increase to Sisters of Avalorn and Handmaidens in her own army. Unfortunately, she also grows weak as Chaos grows stronger. Her Vortex victory is tied to completing all the rituals and winning the final battle, and her Domination victory involves destroying the major launch factions of Total War Warhammer 2 and holding 50 provinces through direct ownership, vassals, or military alliances. In the Mortal Empires campaign, she brings in an additional unit of Dryads alongside the Treekin and Sisters of Avalorn, but otherwise retains the same qualities and has the same start position as well. Her long campaign objectives here include obtaining the full control of Ulthuan, either directly or through vassals and alliances, the destruction of Harganeth, Scourge of Cain, Norska, and Wintertooth, the conquest of the assortment of capital cities that everybody shares in Mortal Empires, the construction of the Court of the Everqueen, and the expansion of territory to trigger the arrival of Archaon. Her short victory ignores Norska and Wintertooth as targets for destruction, and reduces the number of capital settlements that need to be conquered from 12 to 8. In both modes, we see her starting with a Handmaiden hero unit, and there are a few interesting changes and mechanics worth discussing. For one, Alariel has a unique right replacing the Invocation of Hoeth with the Invocation of Lilith. This gives buffs to Sisters of Avalorn, Handmaidens, and Dryads as you can see on screen, rather than buffs to Mages and Loremasters of Hoeth and Winds of Magic. We also see the Defender of Ulthuan, a gradient that reflects Alariel's ties to and protection of Ulthuan. The more control the Elves have over Ulthuan, the higher people's trust in Alariel, and the better the situation gets across a multitude of mechanics such as public order, diplomatic relations, construction costs, income, etc. Finally, some new buildings. The inclusion of the World Root Building Chain allows Alariel to recruit Dryads, Treekin, and Tree Men at building levels 1, 3, and 5 respectively, and the addition of Handmaidens Gallery for all High Elves allows for the recruitment of Sisters of Avalorn and Handmaidens. It should be noted that Alariel gets the building at settlement level 3, while everybody else gets them at level 4. We also see the Court of the Everqueen, adding two Treemen and a Sun Dragon to the city garrison, among other buffs to Public Order, Growth, Lord Recruitment Rank, Casualty Replenishment, Corruption Reduction, and Recruitment Cost Reduction as well. Looking at the character, you can see the trait Mortal Worlds Torment, a trait that worsens as the forces of Chaos get stronger. As Chaos Corruption in Alariel's lands grow from 25 to 50 to 75% or more, Alariel's wound recovery time gets longer, and her army has a harder time using magic, with a reduction of winds of magic going from negative 10 to negative 50, and a base miscast chance going from plus 25 to plus 80% when fighting Norska or Chaos. Despite these debuffs, she gets buffs to recruitment costs, weapon strength, physical resistance, and bonus versus large for herself, or Dryads, Treekin, and Treeman units. When Chaos Corruption is over 75% in Alariel's lands, she also gets the ability to use the Dwellers Below. Moving over to the skill tree, we see some very interesting things. The Star of Avalorn is the sole quest item here, increasing leadership aura size and effect by 25% and 5 respectively, while reducing the Winds of Magic cost for Earthblood and Earthblood upgraded. It also increases replenishment rate for the army and unlocks the Star of Avalorn ability on the battlefield that has two uses per battle with a 120 second cooldown. 
Lasting 27 seconds, it heals up to three allied units within its 15 meter radius and can be targeted anywhere within 200 meters of Valerial. An excellent way to bolster a weakening flank or to help a unit survive as it waits for reinforcements to arrive. We then see the Elven Steed, the Barded Ithilmar Steed, and the Great Eagle, followed by the Ward of Isha 10% ward save, Isha's Blessing reducing mist cast chances and increasing power reserves, Touch of the Everqueen increasing weapon strength and helping against the undead with a plus 4 melee attack to the Lord's army, and finally Chaos Bane that gives a plus 15 bonus versus large and a plus 4 to melee attack to the army when fighting Chaos, Norska, or Beastmen. The yellow line has increases in public order and tax rates, better diplomatic relations with high elves and reduced construction costs in local provinces, better hero capacity and recruitment rank for handmaidens while unlocking their recruitment in all provinces, the help in reducing corruption while also buffing Sisters of Avalorn, melee defense and reducing recruitment time. Separately, we see unit upkeep reduction and campaign movement buffs, melee defense and leadership buffs to all local armies, ward save for Alarial buffed alongside the casualty replenishment in her army, and armor for her forest spirit units, and finally, spell cooldown reduction, better power reserves, and melee attack buffs for forest spirit units in her army. She has access to earth blood from the start, and is able to unlock Fa's protection, life bloom, shield of thorns, shield of safari, tempest, exorcism, arcane unforging, and banishment, with evasion in the middle and arcane conduit at the end. Where applicable, her buffs to range units in the red line include the new Sisters of Avalorn, Shadow Walkers, and Shadow Warriors. On the battlefield, she's a spellcaster, though she has better melee stats than the likes of Teclas, and she causes magical damage. Her weapon strength also includes 100 points of armor-piercing damage, but her low armor and health make her a soft target if not well managed. On Elven Steed, she gets slightly more health, a much higher speed, and a slightly improved charge bonus, while a Barded Ithilmar Steed has the same stat increase as an Elven Steed, with some added armor and some reduced speed. Finally, the Great Eagle gives a big bump to health, doubles her base armor, significantly increases speed, and also increases weapon strength and charge bonus by a great degree. On the Eagle, her armor-piercing damage goes up to 156 points. She starts with 15% missile resistance and gets martial prowess as well. Her abilities include Life Bloom, Shield of Safari, Arcane Conduit, and the Boon of Isha, an area augment that gives an immunity to psychology and imbues magical damage to herself and allies within 40 meters. Just a note, this magical damage is added to melee and ranged damage alike, so a great tool to bring against physically resistant foe like the Skaven or Wood Elves and such. We've already gone over her spell selection, so we'll skip that here and move to her items. Shieldstone of Isha gives a constant plus 12 physical resistance to allies within a 40 meter radius. This can help any unit, of course, and can give some extra protection to units like Dragon Princes and Phoenix Guard who already have an innate physical resistance to begin with. When playing as Avalorn specifically, you're also able to bring in Forest Spirit units, and they all start with a 20% physical resistance that can be buffed with the Shieldstone. The Stave of Avalorn greatly improves power recharge rate and reduces miscast chance by 100%, but can only be used once, lasting 40 seconds, and the Star of Avalorn, as mentioned earlier, is a 15 meter healing spell that can be cast on the ground, on herself, or on an ally, providing replenishment for up to 3 allies within the radius for 27 seconds. It has 2 uses, with a 120 second cooldown. Moving on to our other titular character, Crone Helebron leads the Dark Elves of Harganeth. In the Vortex campaign, she starts at Harganeth, alongside her additional starting units of Harganeth Executioners and Sisters of Slaughter. Faction effects tie closely to Death Knight, the in-game option to sacrifice slaves in order to spawn an allied Blood Voyage army, and also to avoid penalties that rise from ignoring the ritual that keeps Crone Helebron looking young. She also sees increased capacity for Death Hags and more casualties captured after battle. Within her own army, as her lord effects, we'll see a 50% reduction in upkeep for Witch Elves, Sisters of Slaughter, and Harganeth Executioners, and her Vortex victory also works towards completing all rituals and winning the final battle, while her Domination victory also seeks the destruction of the major launch factions of the game and the control of 50 provinces through direct ownership, vassals, or military alliances. In the Mortal Empires campaign, she adds a unit of Dreadspears to her starting extras of Harganeth Executioners and Sisters of Slaughter, but otherwise starts at the same location. Her long campaign victory will keep you busy for a while as she tries to conquer, vassalize, or make military allies of all of Nagaron that is playable in the Mortal Empires map, as well as Avalorn, Nagarith, the Unicorn Gate and the Phoenix Gate on Ulthuan, and Kuhon, Hellspire Mountains, Vanaheim Mountains, Ice Tooth Mountains, Leoness, the Wasteland, Heikland, Bordelot, Forest of Ardennes, Baston, and Paravon. 
You must also destroy Nagarith, Avalorn, Grand, and the Cult of Pleasure, Bretonia, and Norska. And then there are these ten settlements that need taking, one way or another, including the Shrine of Cain, Gain Vale, and the Temple of Cain. You must also construct Hellebron's Palace, the Fiery Pits of Sacrifice, the Shrine of the Widowmaker, and the Vandalized Court of the Everqueen, capture 25,000 battle captives, have 5 Death Hags, and 20 units of Witch Elves, Sisters of Slaughter, or Hargeneth Executioners. Her short campaign victory drops the numbers and reduces the provinces she's chasing after, and the factions that need to be destroyed are just Nagarith, Avalorn, and Grond. In either mode, a Death Hag joins her in the province as well, and we see some interesting mechanics to make her stand apart from the other Dark Elves. The Sacrifice to Cain now takes the second slot, with the Sacrifice to Drakira taking the third slot, and granting buffs to recruited Death Hags and Witch Elves, and helping in fighting High Elves while reducing diplomatic relations with them. The Death Knight is a unique mechanic available only to Hellebron. It is a ritual that she must go through to maintain her youth. Maybe it's Maybelline, maybe it's the ritualistic murder of countless screaming slaves. Who knows? Going with the latter, you must obtain an increasing number of slaves every time you perform the Death Knight, starting with 800. And every time you perform Death Knight, you'll spawn a Blood Voyage army that will head towards Ulthuan until you've cleansed it of High Elves. After that's done, you'll have direct control every time. Be warned, though these soldiers might be fast, cheap, and unbreakable, they will not replenish. The ritual will also rejuvenate the Crone, giving Lords a chance to gain loyalty per turn, reducing Vigor loss for Crone Hellebron by 25%, increasing physical resistance for Crone Hellebron and Witch Elves by 20%, and increasing leadership for all armies and public order for all provinces. Over time, the values are reduced as she becomes merely joyous, and even further when she is merely respected. As the gauge empties, Crone Hellebron becomes bitter, and now we see the debuffs. Reduced Vigor, reduced Physical Resistance where there once was a buff, and reduced Leadership, Public Order, and Tax Rates, with the final stage being Crone that furthers the very same debuffs. We also see the inclusion of buildings such as the Fiery Pits of Sacrifice and Hellebron's Palace, both at level 5, both giving a variety of buffs and a great increase to the garrison. The entertainment line of buildings also sees the inclusion of Sisters of Slaughter as a recruitment option at Tier 3, Fighting Pits. Looking at the skill tree, we can see one quest item in Death Sword and the Cursed Blade, a powerful weapon that enables magical attacks, buffs melee stats, increases weapon strength, and also causes direct damage to enemy units that are losing melee as long as Hellebron is in melee and they are within 30 meters of her. The mounts include a Dark Steed, a Cauldron of Blood, and a Manticore, and then we see the Greater Ward of Cain's Missile Resistance and Witch Brew, which unlocks the second Cauldron buffs to Witch Brew and the Secrets of the Cauldron for more hit points. The yellow line has improvements to Physical Resistance, more uses of the Gaze of Cain ability, buffs to Witch Elves, Sisters of Slaughter and Hargeneth Executioners, better charge bonuses and bonuses versus infantry, as well as increased casualties captured, better loyalty for new recruits, and reduced slave decline rate, capping off with Blood Queen, giving higher rank to units in Death Knight armies while increasing the Crone's hit points and giving her the regeneration passive ability. The second line includes buffs to melee stats, charge bonus, leadership, weapon strength, hit points, speed, and ends with Heroic Killing Blow with Blood Frenzy in the middle. Blood Frenzy only helps the Crone herself and only recharges when engaged in melee. It lasts 90 seconds, increasing armor piercing damage and vigor over the three stages, split over 30 seconds each. Further down, we see the integration of the Doomfire Warlocks and Sisters of Slaughter units, and we also see the Red Line get two passive abilities, Strength Through Spite and Kindle the Fury. The former gives a plus 5 melee attack buff to herself and allies within a 30 meter radius, and the latter replaces the former, giving a plus 9 to melee attack and plus 6% weapon damage in a 40 meter radius. On the battlefield, Crone Hellebron is an anti-infantry armor-piercing fighter. Her low armor is mitigated by 20% physical resistance, great leadership, solid melee stats, the ability to cause poison damage, and 330 points of armor piercing damage, and 20 points of bonus versus infantry are all huge. And of course, there's a matter of murderous mastery that helps in melee as well. Upon her dark steed, we see an increase to health, speed, and charge bonus, and on the manticore we see increases to health, armor, speed, charge bonus, but with a reduction to melee attack and defense. The Manticore is also slower than the Dark Steed, and though it adds Siege Attacker, Fear, and Terror, it removes Physical Resistance and replaces it with 15% Missile Resistance. Finally, the Cauldron of Blood greatly increases Health and Armor, with a small increase to Speed and a sacrifice to Melee Stats, Weapon Strength, and Charge Bonus. She also loses Physical Resistance, but gains 25% Magic and Missile Resistance, and the ability to cause Fear and Terror, and her Armor Piercing Damage drops to 155 points. Her abilities include Strength through Spite, 
Blood Frenzy, Heroic Killing Blow, and Witch Brew, which we're all familiar with now. Then there's the Gaze of Cain, which has similarities to the Fury of Cain ability from the Blood Cauldron, though it has a buff to leadership along with increases to melee attack, weapon damage, alongside causing affected units to rampage. And it can be cast on the ground or on an ally, lasting 28 seconds and working on units within its 30 meter range. With 3 uses and 90 second cooldowns, it can really help overpower the enemy at crucial junctures. Her items include the Cursed Blade, with its ability to cause direct damage to those losing melee within 30 meters, as long as the crone is in melee herself, and the Amulet of Dark Fire, that gives a constant plus 33% magic resistance to allies within 40 meters of her. Pair that with physically resistant units, and you've got an interesting combination. Finally, as a slight tangent, we're going to discuss Alith Anar. He's not part of the Queen and the Chrome DLC, but he's releasing for free at the same time, and this leader of Nagarith deserves some attention. In the Vortex campaign, he starts on Nagaroth with a foothold at the Broken Lands, holding Black Creek Spire. A Moon Dragon and Shadow Walkers are his extra starting units, and his faction is suited to live in Wastelands, has an interesting Mark for Death mechanic I'll get into momentarily, sees global recruitment durations reduced, and increased campaign movement ranges for all armies. The Lord's armies have upkeep cost reduction for Shadow Walkers and a 25% increase to ambush success chance. His Vortex victory conditions are a matter of completing all rituals and winning the final battle, while Domination has him destroying the major factions from launch alongside needing those 50 provinces one way or another. In the Mortal Empires campaign, we see Alith Anar starting at the Black Coast with a provincial capital of Arnheim. He's still on Nagaroth, but very close to home. Long campaign objectives include the capture of most of the playable Nagaroth and his home of Nagarith, the destruction of five Dark Elf factions, and the famous Twelve Settlements objective. We also need to construct the Black Citadel of Anlek and maintain three Moon Dragons. The short campaign victory has the numbers reduced for the same objectives. Once again, we see the inclusion of a new rite, the Invocation of Morai Heg. As long as you've issued the Reaver Patrols commandment in a province and have the money for it, this rite can be performed to hire a Hand of the Shadow Crown Assassin at your capital. We also see a new stance added, allowing you to use the Shadow Realm pathways to travel through impassable terrain. We don't know yet if it's possible to get banished to this realm, only time will tell. The addition of the Asenar camp as an advanced military building at level 2 gives access to Shadow Walkers and Shadow Warriors alongside various buffs to the campaign map. The juiciest of additions is the Marked for Death mechanic. New targets for assassination are assigned, and eliminating these characters one way or another will give you various benefits, typically money and influence, but you might also unlock buffs to diplomatic relations, or upkeep reduction, or even start causing fear. It's a mixed bag, and it's a mechanic that will send you gallivanting across the lands, hunting heads. The skill tree shows a quest for the Moonbow, better range, more ammunition, more missile damage, magical attacks, and the Moonbow magic missile ability that can be used twice with a 120 second cooldown, causing armor piercing damage at a great 300 meter range. Then we see speed and melee defense buffs, missile resistance, magic resistance, enemy hero action chance reduction, and stalking, and finally more campaign movement range alongside perfect vigor to make for a tireless lord. The yellow line helps cause fear and reduce enemy leadership in a region, and then proceeds to buff melee attack, speed and ammunition for Shadow Warrior and Walker units, increase income from looting and sacking while helping the Lord's army fight against Dark Elves, increasing melee defense and ambush success chance, hurting diplomatic relations with High Elves while getting better missile damage across the faction, ending with the Shadow King that increases public order and upgrades the mislead ability from a harmless clone that grants Alith Anar stock, snipe, and unspottable at the same time to a clone that does all that but also causes 50% damage. The next level of the yellow line helps range and armor piercing missile damage, weapon strength, ammunition and reload time, melee attack, leadership, melee defense, missile damage, speed, and ends with Volley of Arrows with Slippery in the middle. Volley of Arrows is a magic missile that can be used three times with a cooldown of 90 seconds and also causes armor piercing damage with a range of 200 meters. The red line buffs Shadow Walkers and Shadow Warriors wherever ranged buffs are involved and we see two new passive abilities, Loose and Darken the Skies. The former is a passive that buffs reload skill by 10 for himself and allies within 40 meters, while the latter replaces loose and doubles the buff. On the battlefield, we have a bit of a sniper that can put up a decent fight in melee. Middling armor, but decent stats across the board, including 140 points of armor piercing damage in melee and 250 points from range. You can have Alith Anar play as a bit of a 360 degree artillery piece with his great range of 302. 
He comes in with 15% missile resistance, is able to vanguard deploy and fire in all directions while moving, and martial prowess applies to him as well, of course. Darken the Skies, Slippery, and Mislead are abilities we've discussed, and Mislead is a very interesting one that, just as a reminder, allows Aleth Anar to make a clone of himself while getting the traits Stalk, Snipe, and Unspottable for the real him, which makes for a great escape as he's invisible when firing as well. And you get to control the illusion too, so you can really bait and confuse even a human opponent if you're able to tuck into some trees first. You can use it three times with a 90 second cooldown. Items he can bring include the Shadow Crown to increase ability range by 70 meters, and also increase speed and melee defense, not only for himself, but also allies within 55 meters of himself, as long as there are enemies in the area. The Stone of Midnight gives a plus 22% missile resistance to himself and allies within 55 meters, while the Moonbow is that armor-piercing magic missile we discussed earlier, with two uses and 120 second cooldowns. The Sword of Cain is a new mechanic that is available to all factions, and this is the last thing to touch on here. If you control the Shrine of Cain as any of the Elves, Wood, Dark, the or High, you can draw the Sword of Cain. Then, any faction can actually obtain the Sword of Cain by defeating the current bearer in battle, giving a huge increase to armor piercing damage, melee attack, and ward save while making the user unbreakable, imbuing them with magical attacks, and giving them the Sword of Cain ability. This is all just at the base level of the sword, things get even crazier. Now, the Sword of Cain ability is a vortex spell that lasts 11 seconds, recharges when engaged in melee, and causes a great deal of magical damage, works well against heavily armored units, and also inflicts the madness of Cain, forcing units to stay engaged, potentially in unfavorable situations, while also reducing melee defense and speed stats. With great power, however, comes great danger. Starting with small debuffs, the trouble that the Sword of Cain causes on the campaign map grows worse and worse, getting a stronger grip on the wielder over time until the sword is lost or thrown aside. Anytime the location of the sword changes, your faction will be notified so you can go hunting for the power it provides. If you're interested in seeing these stats and learning more about the individual units that the new DLC brings alongside the Regiments of Renown, check out the next video linked on the screen right now, and down below in the description as well. I've also got a Hellebron campaign linked on screen right now, and remember, for more Total War content, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Till next time, thank you very much for watching, and cheers!